Hi, Genetic Innovation students. Welcome to your next lecture in Section 1 on Genome Structure. In this lecture, we'll still be concentrating on the first learning objective, which is to differentiate between prokaryotic and eukaryotic genomes. In the previous lecture, we spoke about prokaryotic genomes, and now we'll be looking at eukaryotic genomes in a little bit more detail. Eukaryotic genomes are split into a set of linear DNA molecules called chromosomes. So if you remember from the previous lecture, we spoke about prokaryotes having a single circular DNA chromosome. However, in eukaryotes, chromosomes are linear rather than circular. Eukaryotes also have a minimum of at least two linear chromosomes. These chromosomes are contained within a membrane-bound organelle called the nucleus. So unlike the prokaryotic genome, the eukaryotic genome is separated from other cytoplasmic components within the cell through this membrane-bound organelle or the nuclear membrane. Eukaryotic cells are also diploid. Remember, all eukaryotic cells besides gametic cells are diploid, which means that they have two copies of each chromatid within their genomes. In addition to nuclear DNA, eukaryotic cells may also contain extrachromosomal DNA. Extrachromosomal DNA is DNA that's not contained within the nucleus, and this can be in the form of mitochondrial DNA or chloroplasts in the case of plants. Human mitochondrial DNA is also a single circular double-stranded DNA molecule. The mitochondrial genome is much smaller than the nuclear genome, and it's also highly dependent on proteins that are transcribed from the nuclear genome in order to perform their function. The nuclear genome, on the other hand, is much larger and it's structurally different to mitochondrial DNA. In humans, Nuclear genomes are comprised of 23 chromosomes, and these are diploid. The only cells that are not diploid in humans are the gametic cells. Now, if we look a little bit more deeply into the chromosomes, the length of each chromosome is approximately 5 centimeters long, and the diploid genome has a total length of about 2 meters. This 2 meter length of DNA has to package itself into a nucleus which has a diameter of just 10 micrometers. In order to achieve this, eukaryotic DNA is tightly wound around a protein complex that is comprised of eight histones. And this complex is called the nucleosome, which is able to wind approximately 146 base pairs of DNA. Please go to these references, which is also included in your resources tab, for more information to support these slides. We're now going to go over DNA packaging in eukaryotes. The DNA double-strand helix wraps itself around the optima of eight histones 1.65 times. Nucleosomes are then further coiled to form 30 nanometer chromatin fibers. These chromatin fibers further compress themselves to form chromatin loops, which are approximately 300 nanometers in length. The loops are then further compressed and folded to produce a 250 nanometer wide fiber, which has a diameter of approximately 700 nanometers. Beyond this, the chromatin fiber is more firmly compacted to form chromosomes. This highly compacted chromosome has a width of 1,400 nanometers, allowing the chromatin to package itself within the 10 micrometer nucleus. These chromosomes are visible in this form during metaphase of the cell cycle during cell division. During interphase of the cell cycle, however, chromatin fibers are more loosely packed in order to allow for gene expression. We'll now discuss histones and the nucleosome. The histone optima is comprised of four major histones, H2A, H2B, H3, and H4. There are two copies of each of these histones in the optima. In addition to the four core histones, we also have histone H1, which is further able to wind 20 base pairs of DNA. 
and this also allows for two full turns of DNA to form around the core histone optima. These nucleosomes then combine to form the chromatosome. Histones within the nucleosome can undergo various types of modifications. Some of these modifications include acetylation, which is the addition of an acetyl group, methylation, phosphorylation, as well as ubiquitination. So in order for the cell to gain access to the DNA wound around histones, nucleosomes can be modified in order to allow for expression of certain genes, DNA repair, replication of the genome, as well as repression of certain DNA sequences. So how are histones modified? I've mentioned in the previous slide that histones can be acetylated, methylated, as well as phosphorylated and ubiquitinated. We'll just focus on histone acetylation for now. Acetylation involves the attachment of acetyl groups on lysine residues within the histone proteins. And these enzymatic reactions are catalyzed by histone acetyl transferases or HATs. Now, HATs on their own do not act alone. HATs act in complexes with other proteins in order to regulate which histones they act upon. Acetylation of histones results in uncoiling of the DNA strand at that locus. And so, acetylation of a histone can result in uncoiling and looping out of a certain fragment of DNA, which allows gene expression by allowing transcription factors to access that strand of DNA. However, histone acetylation is not the only determinant of gene expression because transcriptional activators and repressors also play a role in regulating gene expression. Acetylation of histones does, however, allow transcription factors or repressors to bind to that region of DNA. In addition to histone acetylation, Histones can be deacetylated as well. Histone deacetylation refers to the removal of these histone acetyl marks. This is catalyzed by a group of enzymes called histone deacetylases or HDACs. Like HATs, HDACs also act in complex with other regulatory proteins that specify the histones upon which they act. Histone deacetylases are capable of binding to methylated DNA. DNA methylation refers to the addition of methyl groups on cytosine residues, and this is frequently associated with repression of genes. Histone deacetylases act in opposition to histone acetylases, HATs, which means that histone deacetylation is also associated with gene repression. So now we know that histone deacetylation and DNA methylation can work hand in hand. And so that tells us that these two processes can be coordinated to repress specific genetic loci. Altered regulation of histone deacetylation or histone acetylation are frequently linked to diseases. And so it's very important for us to understand how these processes work. In addition to modification of histones, the entire nucleosome can also be remodeled. Nucleosomes can be repositioned along the strand of DNA in order to facilitate access to different regions of a chromosome. And this process is broadly referred to as nucleosome remodeling. Nucleosome remodeling can occur in three different ways. Number one, the structure of the nucleosome is altered but its position remains unaltered. So the nucleosome has been showed to double in size and the mechanism by which this occurs is still unknown. However, increasing the size of the nucleosome can allow for larger amounts of DNA to be coiled around the nucleosome. And so therefore, we can then say that DNA can shift around the nucleosome because if the nucleosome is, cap because if the nucleosome is capable of binding more than 146 bases of DNA, 
the neighboring sequences of DNA would have to shift along so that more DNA can be occupied in the space of that particular nucleosome. That's referred to as nucleosome remodeling. Nucleosomes can also slide along a DNA strand in cis. So when we say in cis, what we mean is along the same strand of DNA. So the nucleosome can either shift to the left or to the right along the same strand of DNA, facilitating access to different parts of the DNA strand at different points in time. In addition to sliding, nucleosomes can also transfer. This is also called transdisplacement, as the nucleosome is capable of transferring to another strand of DNA or to an adjacent part of the same strand of DNA, so an adjacent part of the chromosome or to a different chromosome completely. The SWE SNF complex is an example of a protein complex that is responsible for nucleosome remodeling. So nucleosomes do not shift around along the DNA strand on their own. This process is tightly regulated by complexes of different proteins that interact with the nucleosomes. Now we'll talk a little bit about a concept that is recently being developed. We spoke about how nucleosomes can move along the DNA fiber. And we now know that they can reposition themselves or be removed from the fiber completely. So what happens when nucleosomes shift around is that they release segments of unwound DNA. And these segments are called chromatin loops or clusters. These loops can have variable sizes. So the individual loops have variable sizes and nucleosomes can be shifted around to alter and vary the sizes of these loops along specific strands of DNA. We now know that these individual chromatin loops or clusters of chromatin loops can arrange themselves to specific positions within the chromosomal space. And these specific positions are called topology-associated domains or chromatin domains. So we have specific loops of chromatin that have been unwound and associated with different points in the chromosome or within compartments in the chromosome. So certain TADs cluster into mutually exclusive compartments, which means that they can move around to specific compartments or as the chromosome moves around, specific domains of uncoiled or looped chromatin can cluster into specific regions. Heterochromatic and euchromatic regions of the same chromosome occupy different TADs. So we've learned about heterochromatin and euchromatin before. And just to remind you that heterochromatin refers to very tightly coiled chrom uh, chromosomal DNA and euchromatin refers to slightly loosely packed, slightly more loosely packed chromosomal DNA. And gene dense regions are usually euchromatic, which means that they can be uncoiled readily in order to allow for gene expression. So the fact that these regions, heterochromatic and euchromatic regions of the same chromosome can occupy different space or certain domain space within the space of the chromosome, suggests that the structure of the genome is highly linked to its function and gene expression. So now we know that heterochromatic regions and euchromatic regions occupy different, different positions in these topology associated domains. And so we can also determine that the position of DNA strands within these domains can vary. And this is thought to regulate gene expression by allowing for transcription factor access to specific parts of the genome, as well as mediating interchromosomal interactions. And so what we have here are these TADs and these cluster within the chromosome. And these TADs can occupy different positions within the chromosomal space. So we, if we have, for example, a TAD here and another TAD here for the neighboring chromosome, interactions or transcription factor access to both of these chromosomes may be allowed. This can facilitate gene expression of two different regions within the genome by the same set of transcription factors, which bind to the same promoter sequences in both chromosomes.
So from this diagram, we can see that individual chromosomes occupy distinct positions in the nucleus. However, the position of these chromosomes may vary from cell to cell. So if we just look at the green chromosome here, for example, in this diagram, it's up here on the left, it can move to the center and then it can move off to different positions within the nucleus. So although these chromosomes occupy a specific space, so the chromosome itself is together, occupies a specific region, the entire chromosome can move around to different positions within the nucleus at different points in time. And so what this tells us is that a single transcription factor may access various parts of the genome at the same time through reorganization of the positions of these chromosomes, as well as movements of these topology associated domains at different points in time during the cell cycle. At this point in time, we don't know exactly what regulates the movements of chromosomes within the nucleus and how topology associated domains are organized. However, these are new studies and this is what we know right now. And so overall, if I was just to summarize this image, we know now that nucleosomes hold DNA in specific positions, but nucleosomes are able to move along in order to form chromatin loops and clusters that are loose, and that these unlooped regions of the genome can cluster into specific parts called topology associated domains within the chromosomal space. These topology associated domains can move around within the chromosomal space, and each chromosome can also move around within the nucleus, thus facilitating transcription factor access to certain parts of the genome at certain points in time. And so genome organization largely impacts on gene expression programs and which genes are expressed at which point in time. So understanding how these processes work is highly important, yet we are only at the beginning phase of truly understanding how genomes are organized. So this concludes my lecture on genome organization in eukaryotes. We'll now move on to the next part of this uh, section of part A, and that's to look at transcription and translation differences in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Following that, we'll move on to part B involving DNA extraction and analysis. So you may now close the slide and move on to the next two videos on translation and transcription in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Thank you.